All right. Can folks see this? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. So I'll be talking about CF related diabetes and what causes it and why it matters um, to people with CF. And really, I'll, I'll be focusing um, on these topics. There's a lot more to CFRD um, than what I'll be covering today and can cover in the time allotted. Um, but hopefully, I'll be able to address these, um, this really important question. Um, all right, so first off, why does it matter if people with CF have diabetes? The burden of care from other medical treatments of CF is already really complex. Um, at the onset and diagnosis of diabetes, um, arguably many people may not feel symptoms of diabetes. Um, and interestingly, historically, the argument existed that people with CF might not live long enough to develop what we classically think of as complications related to high blood sugars, such as eye disease and kidney disease. Um, but really, um, a lot of research has emerged over the last couple of decades, really highlighting the importance of CF-related diabetes for CF health. And that's what I'll be covering um, today. So CF-related diabetes is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. Um, as of the latest data, CF diabetes is associated with, and this has been shown in a number of studies, a three to four fold greater risk of death compared to CF, patients who have CF and don't have diabetes. Um, and the CFRD is the result of insulin deficiency, which leads to weight loss and elevated blood sugars. And these high blood sugars can increase infection, inflammation, and affect lung function. And over the course of this talk, I'm gonna go into um, these two components in more detail. Um, but first off, some data regarding um, mortality outcomes in people with diabetes and with without, without diabetes. Now, this figure um, is a key figure um, with data um, generated from the University of Minnesota. And this, um, the CF Center at the University of Minnesota has done a led, um, um, the CFRD um, research has really been led by um, Dr. Antoinette Moran. And they have been one of the centers um, with the most rigorous um, screening for CF-related diabetes over the last three decades. And they have just done a really good job of screening all their patients with CF for CF-related diabetes. And in the 90s, um, when they first published some of these data, um, what you can see here in the solid lines are data from females and males who have diabetes compared to um, patients without diabetes. And what you're seeing here is a more than tenfold um, increased risk of mortality in patients who have diabetes compared to those who don't. Now, over the years with improved treatment, um, more aggressive treating treatment of CF-related diabetes with insulin, you can see that this mortality gap has decreased. So that as of the latest data um, in the 2000s um, and early uh, 2010s, this mortality gap has increased significantly. However, in patients with diabetes compared to those without, there still is a more than threefold um, greater risk of death in patients who have diabetes. Now, this has been shown in registry data as well. Um, and there have been some really nice data from the UK registry that have shown um, a fourfold risk of death. Um, from diabetes compared to patients without. Um, this shows data of, by age, um, comparing patients without diabetes in the white bars, oops, excuse me, um, and patients with diabetes in the black bars. And what we can see here is that across the lifespan, diabetes is associated with an increased risk of mortality. Um, these are data looking at hyperglycemia. So, high blood sugars and the association between blood sugar and risk of death. And um, these are looking at, again, UK registry data where over 500 um, individuals with, were, with CF were followed for two years. And at baseline, what they did was they looked at patients with diabetes who had A1Cs above 6.5% versus below 6.5%. And at baseline, they were similar in age, sex, BMI and pulmonary function, as well as use of steroids. Um, after two years, 36 individuals died. And when they compared A1C in those who died compared to those who didn't, A1C rates were higher. Um, 
And they concluded that this A1C over 6.5%, um, they looked at this, was associated, with, again, with an increased risk of death, a triple, um, uh, that diabetes tripled your risk of death, um, as demonstrated by the hazard ratio here. Other data looking at medical interventions, and these are data from the US um, patient registry, have shown that diabetes is associated with an increased need for medical interventions. Um, so these are data comparing over 1,000 patients with diabetes compared to patients without diabetes. And what we can see here um, are that patients with diabetes have an increased need for therapies. So pulmazine, airway clearance, um, bronchodilators, NSAIDs, um, or uh, excuse me, not NSAIDs, but oral supplements, enteral supplementation, steroids, oxygen, and diuretic need. So how prevalent is CF diabetes? Um, in the US, there are over 31,000 individuals with cystic fibrosis. And again, these are data from the University of Minnesota, which has um, done just a really nice job of screening patients with um, for CF diabetes. And what their data show are that in adults over the age of 18, 30 to 50%, up to 50% of the population um, will develop CF-related diabetes. Up to 20% of young adults and um, adolescents develop CF related diabetes. And it can even be seen in kids under the age of 10 years. Um, and reports have suggested as high as 2% two, um, 2 or more. Although typically um, patients under 10 aren't often being screened routinely um, at most centers, but they may be picked up um, for other reasons due to um, increased um, exacerbations and potentially glucose is detected during admissions. All right, so what causes CF diabetes? Um, CF-related diabetes is primarily a disease of insulin deficiency. In other words, the pancreas does not make enough insulin. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next few slides. Insulin resistance um, is also an important um, um, thing to understand. And what this is, is it's a state where um, the body may make insulin and may make a lot of insulin, but the tissues in the body don't respond to the insulin that's being produced. Um, and this is um, an image uh, illustrating globally what this um, process looks like, um, a very simplified version of this. So after eating a meal, eating carbohydrates, carbohydrates are broken, broken down um, and the glucose or blood or sugars are absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, the pancreas then has an important role of making insulin um, in addition to other functions, um, but the pancreas has the important role of releasing insulin, um, this hormone into the bloodstream, which acts as a key. Um, I, I like to think of it as a key or a bridge to allow the sugars in the bloodstream to get taken up by the cells in the body and used as fuel. Um, glucose is a really important source of fuel to help um, muscle um, do its work and it's also taken up um, by the liver as a source of storage fuel um, and to be used for later. And in states where the pancreas isn't producing enough insulin, there's insulin insufficiency or insulin deficiency, um, glucose can't be taken up by the cells and glucose levels in the blood start to rise. Um, in this figure, um, this goes into more detail, um, illustrating really the many contributors to the development of diabetes and people with cystic fibrosis. Um, so the CF, uh, mutations in the CFTR gene re result in a defective CFTR protein. And CFTR, um, as we know, is present throughout the body, but specifically in the pancreas, it, um, um, Many folks are familiar with the exocrine um, impairments of cystic fibrosis. And this leads to thick secretions that obstruct the pancreatic duct and over time lead to scarring of the pancreas, um, fat infiltration into the pancreas, and beta cells, which are the cells that produce insulin, are scattered throughout the pancreas. And the scarring and inflammation of the pancreas um, leads to, over time, problems with release of insulin, um, delays and decreases in insulin secretion, which contribute to CF-related diabetes. Now, um, we know that CF is also associated with infection, um, chronic infection, inflammation, 
This over time leads to insulin resistance. Um, and there's also really emerging data that inflammation directly contributes to beta cell dysfunction. Um, so impairments in how those beta cells work and lead to decreased insulin secretion. Um, and these factors can lead to, so this inflammation, recurrent exacerbations, um, infection lead to this insulin resistance that we were talking about um, that can be periodic, um, many patients prior to development of CFRD um, may, may not have obvious insulin resistance, but certainly during periods of stress, of illness, with um, need for steroids, so prednisone bursts, these can all, these are things that can all contribute to insulin resistance. Um, insulin resistance at the level of the liver leads to increased blood sugars, and all these factors can contribute to development of CF-related diabetes. Um, I wanted to point out this decreased muscle mass um, component here, particularly for this audience. Um, muscle, as noted earlier, skeletal muscle is really important for um, uptake of glucose and decreased muscle mass can also contribute to um, decreased uptake of glucose and contribute to the development of CF-related diabetes. Um, it's important to understand that CF-related diabetes is different from type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And I always like to um, take you know, some time to review this because many folks, when they first hear about CF diabetes, um, you know, have heard about or know somebody with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And in fact, most of the, the literature that you may come across online about diabetes um, pertains to type 2, but may not be specific and usually isn't specific to CF. Um, and it's important to understand some of these differences. So type 1 diabetes um, is actually the most common type of diabetes we see in pediatrics, um, endocrinologists see in pediatrics, and um, it's autoimmune in nature. Um, and what that means is the immune system, which normally helps us fight off infection, uh, it actually targets those insulin producing cells in the pancreas, those beta cells, and it wipes them out. So that by the time someone presents with symptoms of type 1 diabetes, insulin secretion is almost nearly wiped out. Um, and when the body is unable to make insulin and does not have any insulin around, it actually can be really dangerous and put people at risk for something called diabetic ketoacidosis, um, where protein and fat start to break down and it can develop um, something called ketone bodies and can make people really, really sick. When there is insulin around, um, ketoacidosis is is unusual. Um, it, I won't say it never happens, but it's pretty rare in other forms of, uh, um, or let, you know, other forms of diabetes. Um, it's certainly not seen um, to the frequency that is seen in people with type one diabetes. In type two diabetes, this is really worldwide the most common type of diabetes um, that exists. And most of the literature out there pertaining to diabetes that you may come across online pertains to type two. In type two, um, early on, it's it's primarily a disease of, we were talking about this insulin resistance. It's a disease of insulin resistance early on. Um, the body may make huge amounts of insulin. The pancreas may make huge amounts of insulin, but the tissues in the body don't respond to that insulin that's being made. And over time, um, those insulin making cells can burn out um, and there's a relative insulin deficiency. So there's not enough insulin around for the body's needs. And to address it, we can, encourage people to lose weight, um, try diet and exercise to try to increase that insulin sensitivity in the tissues. Um, this doesn't apply to CF. So CF diabetes, um, it does have components as mentioned before of insulin deficiency and insulin resistance, um, but it's different and you may come some folks may have heard the term type 3C diabetes, and that's all another term for CF-related diabetes or diabetes that's related to problems with the pancreas directly, inflammation of the pancreas um, that are not type 1 or type 2. So it's a different entity. Um, and in thinking about why we treat CF-related diabetes and the importance of it, it's really to, important to to think about CF diabetes in the context of CF. Um, at onset, CF diabetes may actually seem milder than type one because that 
degree of insulin deficiency isn't as profound as type 1 diabetes, um, but that insulin deficiency still has really important implications for someone living with CF. Um, so microvascular complications, just thinking about long term, they can be seen in all forms of diabetes, and it's related to high blood sugar. So what are these microvascular complications? So um, it's damage to to the eyes, to the kidneys, um, to the nerves related to chronic high blood sugars and impairment in blood flow um, to target tissues. And we see this in type one and type two diabetes. Um, and it can also be seen in patients with CF related diabetes. Just briefly, macrovascular complications, um, those are complications um, such as um, heart disease, strokes. Um, those are um, some of the top morbidities related to, to type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, that we target with treatment. We do not see this yet with CF-related diabetes, at least thus far, this hasn't been described, um, although I have heard of potentially some case reports. Um, but in, in the literature, um, macrovascular complications haven't yet been described in CF-related diabetes. But as people are living healthier and longer lives, um, I think this is something that is important to pay attention to. And it's important to note that the number one cause of death in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes is cardiovascular disease. In CF diabetes, it's lung disease. And so we really need to think about treatment in the context um, of CF. And the recommended treatment for CF-related diabetes for that insulin deficiency is insulin replacement. Um, just to, to highlight some additional factors that are unique to CF, um, undernutrition is often a huge concern. Patients with CF have increased energy expenditure. Their caloric needs are higher and they're, they're often on high calorie, 3,000, 4,000 calorie um, a day diets. There's inflammation with illness um, that can lead, um, and oftentimes, um, particularly in patients that are undernourished, um, there can be chronic inflammation. And on top of that, infections can lead to intermittent um, um, intermittent inflammation, steroid bursts, which can be good for calming, um, calming lung inflammation can lead to high blood sugars. There's altered gut nutrient absorption and transit time. And CF liver disease is also known to be a risk factor for CF related diabetes. All right, so <clears throat> how do we diagnose CF diabetes? And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this, um, but these are the diagnostic criteria listed here. And of these, the most common um, diagnostic tool is the oral glucose tolerance test. And this is, um, uh, this is something that many of you are probably well familiar with. And what people um, who don't yet have diabetes are um, expected to undergo annually um, and this oral glucose tolerance test. And during the oral glucose tolerance test, a two hour glucose or blood sugar is measured. And when that blood sugar is over 200, that um, is consistent with uh, CF related diabetes. Now, typically in the absence of symptoms, we um, recommend a confirmatory test, but we could also make a diagnosis of diabetes based on elevations in glucose with classic symptoms of diabetes, or if elevations in glucose are noted with two feedings, or even during exacerbations, if you're sick. Um, we've often recommended that when patients are admitted into the hospital um, for exacerbations that their glucose is being monitored. And if we're detecting hyperglycemia, that can also make a diagnosis of CF-related diabetes. Um, and really, you know, this isn't something that, that develops overnight, right? It develops after years of progressive gradual decline in insulin secretion. Um, and what we know now really is that the majority of individuals have some degree of insulin deficiency. Um, and this, this progresses over time as the pancreas, as the beta cells in the pancreas um, are affected and um, insulin secretion decreases. What these figures show um, are changes in glucose during the oral glucose tolerance test, comparing people who don't have CF to individuals with CF. And what we can see here in the dark circles um, are the changes in glucose in over three hours in response to the, to the oral glucose tolerance test. In individuals that are pancreatic sufficient, um, 
you can still see changes, alterations um, in glucose in response to the, to the OGTT uh, with higher glucoses here. Um, although by, by two hours and on um, further on, oftentimes glucose levels come down, concentrations come down. And then individuals who don't yet have diabetes, um, you can see here that even despite, despite um, prior to a diagnosis of diabetes, you can see here that the glucose levels start to rise. Um, they can be elevated at the two hour mark, typically in individuals without diabetes, that two hour glucose is below 140. Um, they can be elevated at the two hour mark or even earlier. Um, and then when diabetes is present, glucose levels are, are, are significantly higher. C-peptide um, is a hormone um, that often in research is used as a surrogate for insulin and insulin secretion. So this is another way to look at insulin secretion. Um, over the course of this oral glucose tolerance test. And you can see here again in these dark circles that in individuals without CF, there's a rapid rise in insulin production within the first 30 minutes immediately after drinking that glucose. However, in individuals with CF, and again, these are pancreatic sufficient individuals here in the open circles, um, there's a delay in that insulin release. So that um, peak insulin it takes longer to get there compared to somebody without, without CF. And um, in individuals who are pancreatic insufficient, we can see even greater delays um, in insulin release and decreases overall in insulin secretion by the time frank CFRD occurs. Uh, so how does CFRD cause clinical decline? So insulin deficiency. Um, insulin is a really potent anabolic hormone. It promotes conservation of body protein, fat, and carbohydrate stores. And malnutrition and protein cult metabolism, a breakdown of protein, are associated with a worse pulmonary function and increased risk of death. What are some of the metabolic consequences of this insulin deficiency in people with CF? So individuals who are malnourished or, or really sick are severely protein catabolic. You're breaking down protein. Um, healthy, interestingly, even healthy nourished CF patients can have subtle defects um, related to this insulin deficiency um, that can affect protein and fat breakdown and may compromise nutrition. And um, there's a thinking that this protein and fat breakdown can be prevented if we can restore that insulin insufficiency um, and replace that replace insulin. Okay, what about high blood sugar? What are the consequences of hyperglycemia? Um, hyperglycemia impairs how the immune system functions. It affects how those white cells um, fight off infection. It can lead to dehydration. It can lead to increased viscosity of mucus secretions. Um, again, it leads to protein breakdown, fatigue, um, and we know that bacteria like glucose, it's a source of fuel for them too. So there have been studies associating hyperglycemia with the higher prevalence of pseudomonas, staph, um, B. sebacea, aspergillus. Um, so bringing down those high glucoses is really important. Um, I, I, I think this is a really nice um, study. And this, the figure I'm showing here are data from a study that look, looked at glucose in the airway. So an airway secretion. Um, now, typically, this isn't something we typically think about, but airway secretions um, in the nose and in the lungs are typically glucose-free. Um, this study, what it showed was when blood sugars increase, um, glucose increases in the airway. So they measured nasal glucose concentrations um, and correlated these with rises in blood glucose or blood sugar. And this dashed line here um, of eight millimoles per liter is equivalent to about 140 milligrams per deciliter. And again, if you recall earlier, this is the cut point um, at which um, individuals who don't have diabetes um, or CF typically don't have glucoses above the 140s. And you can see here that as glucose levels rise above this threshold, nasal glucose secretions increase, highlighting um, again, the importance of trying to achieve normal glucoses uh, to protect airway, um, airway and pulmonary health. So what is the treatment for CF-related diabetes? Uh, it's insulin replacement. 
And the goals of therapy are to maintain nutrition, maintain weight. Um, it's important to monitor not just fasting blood triggers, but also post-meal blood triggers. Um, and then as best as you can, I know this isn't always this isn't always easy, but trying to normalize those blood glucoses to prevent deterioration of lung function associated with CF-related diabetes and to avoid long-term diabetes complications, those microvascular complications that we think about. Um, this is an old picture, but I'm put, um, showing it here because it just shows a really, you know, really the striking anabolic growth promoting effects of insulin. This is actually um, one of the first patients with type one um, diagnosed with type one diabetes to receive insulin treatment. So insulin was only um, developed as a therapy in the 1920s. And prior to that, if you had type one diabetes and made no insulin, um, that was a death sentence. Um, and this is a boy who was able to benefit from insulin. And you can see really some of the dramatic changes um, um, after being treated with insulin. And this table here, again, just highlights um, some of the things that um, we've been talking about. The effects of insulin on liver, it decreases glucose release from the liver. It decreases those ketones or those acids that can be, that can be produced. Now, this is, um, it increases glucose uptake into the muscle. It decreases amino acid or protein breakdown. It increases glucose uptake into adipose tissue and decreases adipose um, lipolysis um, and breakdown. So it's an important anabolic growth promoting hormone. And these are data from the CF registry, um, which has just long shown a really strong association between BMI and better lung function. Um, these are some data from studies that have looked at longitudinally um, the effects of insulin on lung function in patients with diabetes. Um, and you can see here that in the years preceding the diagnosis of CF-related diabetes, there's a decline in FEV1 and FEC. And after initiation of insulin, there's a stabilization in FEV1 and, and, um, and even an improvement in FEC going three um, after these patients are followed three years out. Um, we also see this improvement in weight and BMI um, after initiation of insulin therapy um, in these adults. And these are adults that um, range from 16 to um, into their 30s. Um, and there are also data to suggest that insulin might even improve weight and lung function in patients with CF and pre-diabetes, even before a diagnosis of diabetes. Now, this isn't um, regular practice and something that's, it's an area um, of ongoing research, um, but this is a small study that looked at using Detamir, which is a type of long-acting insulin um, in a group of um, kids with impaired glucose tolerance, so pre-diabetes, um, as well as CF. RD, and it showed improvements in weight and lung function um, after being treated just uh, less than a year. And so um, this is an area of active ongoing research, whether or not it might even help pre-diabetes. Um, microvascular complications, I had alluded to earlier, it is important to screen for these um, uh, after five years out from diagnosis and to screen for some of these things on an annual basis. Um, neuropathy has been described in um, up to 50%, um, retinopathy. Um, uh, so this is a screening that requires annual eye exams to look for eye disease related to high blood triggers, kidney disease, um, an annual urine sample. And then um, diabetes can also affect gastric emptying, which can make blood sugars more difficult to control. Again, macrovascular complications have not yet been reported, um, but with folks living longer and healthier, um, it's something that, to, that you know, I think will be important to, to pay attention to in the years to come. So overall, um, you know, it really takes a team um, patients need to be cared for by, you know, I think increasingly we're realizing that if you can be um, cared for by a multidisciplinary team, um, that this can be um, really beneficial. Pulmonologists working with um, endocrinologists and dietitians, um, as well as a certified diabetes educator and social worker, um, all, you know, 
helping to target optimal nutritional status and weight maintenance. Um, and then really insulin regimens should be tailored to, to an individual's eating patterns and lifestyle. Um, there are different ways to prescribe insulin. Um, basal bolus regimens, in other words, we can give long acting insulins um, as well as um, short acting insulins. Some individuals may require only mealtime injections. Um, and then insulin therapies and regimens may change um, during illness, particularly with steroid need. Um, insulin needs may increase rapidly and decrease potentially after coming off of steroids. Uh, insulin may be required with tube feedings. Physical activity can impact blood sugars. Um, and hypoglycemia too is, is also something that um, you know, folks deal with with and without insulin. Um, I wanted to you know, mention that there have been a number of advances in diabetes technology, and um, I didn't go into this today, um, but Melissa has given some wonderful talks on diabetes technology, um, and I think we're really seeing um, increasing tools to help folks manage blood sugars, insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitoring, um, and closed-loop systems that hopefully will make um, some of the burdens of caring for diabetes and managing blood sugars easier. Um, and then last but not least, I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, some of the, you know, potential exciting um, impacts of CFTR modulator therapy um, in years to come. And these are data that have looked at the, um, the effects of Ivacaftor um, after it was used commercially for five years and have shown that Ivacaftor um, was associated, these are US registry data, um, with lower rates of CF-related diabetes compared to a comparator population. Um, and this suggests that with increased um, uptake of highly effective modulators that really these um, therapies, once they're widely available to the greater population over time, um, you know, I'm really hopeful that this will modify the course of, of CF-related diabetes and the prevalence of CF-related diabetes that we'll see. Um, in summary, you know, folks with CF are really um, living longer and with that, um, as folks are living longer, we may be seeing more CF-related diabetes. However, um, uh, you know, I think as we have more effective treatments, the prevalence of diabetes may change. Um, and for now, have, having a diagnosis of diabetes is related to poor outcomes compared to folks who don't have diabetes, but insulin improves nutrition, it improves lung function, and there really are a number of um, technological advances that are available and on the horizon that can reduce the burden of managing diabetes and improving glycemic control. So in sum, treating insulin deficiency, targeting hyperglycemia, it improves weight, lung function, and lifespan, and you can make a difference to your health by taking care of your diabetes. That is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a whole sheet of questions, but Melissa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. <laughs> but thank you so much, Christine. That was really such a comprehensive, great in-depth um, presentation about it. And, um, you know, some of the technical terms I find that I tend to struggle with, but you really helped explain it well, although some of the charts lost me. <laughs> Too many lines going on. <laughs> that, was, that was fantastic. That was so comprehensive and uh, but easy to understand. I think I learned stuff from that. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So at this time, do you want to, uh, Melissa, do you add anything do you wanted to add or share from an adult perspective, or do you kind of want to open up to questions, answers, dialogue? Yeah, no, I think, um, I, I think I really like you highlighted the unknowns about the, the macro or the cardiovascular disease, because um, it's definitely something that we need to learn more about. I think that um, we're not 
at least I think I struggle. We don't screen, I think, our adult patients with CFRD um, as much as we probably do in other diabetes populations because we've commonly heard that, oh, you know, we don't need to worry about these macrovascular complications. And so I think you're exactly right that, um, especially with trichafta, patients living longer, patients gaining weight, you know, and it is something to, um, to be aware of and that we need to, to study more. But yeah, I think that was that was great, very comprehensive. I think you're to go to the questions. Um, well, one one that I had um, was around the the microvascular and I guess also macro macrovascular <laughs> abilities in the body. And um, I know when we talked last week, uh, I had expressed that I had learned of sort of that microvascular effect on a, from a, a lay perspective, um, when I first had my, my eyes evaluated. And um, so please correct me or adjust me if some of it's inaccurate, but what was explained to me was how the body, especially on a macular, macro vascular level, when there's certain blockages or defects, can have the ability to even reroute or grow another uh, mechanism of bypassing certain blockages. Um, so that response of the ability to get the blood to where it needs to go has adapti adaptivity to it. And on the smallest blood vessel level, the capillaries, and where the capillaries are interfacing with eye tissue, lung tissue. Um, when the blood sugar levels are high and the blood tends to be running thicker at that point, that it's not carrying oxygen as well. And when the tissue requires a certain concentration of oxygen, that the body will work to grow more capillaries to that tissue to provide more oxygen. And as those capillaries, if it's if blood sugar is chronically high and blood sugar and blood sugar is chronically high and blood running thicker um, and carrying less oxygen, that the body will continue to try to grow those capillaries and start to actually suffocate not only the capillaries underneath them, but ultimately depriving the tissue of oxygen as opposed to providing it more as the body's intending. <clears throat> so he said from a, a, an optical perspective, that's what they're kind of looking at in terms of tissue damage and tissue death. But he said the same thing applies in the lungs, that if you're constantly running high blood sugar, carrying less oxygen in your blood flow, that your capillaries are still trying to get more oxygen from the lungs or carbon dioxide to the lungs, but that capillary response um, ultimately ends up causing damage to the tissue because it can't have the, the gaseous exchange. Legit, unlegit, accurate, inaccurate. <laughs> Melissa's, I think, calling me BS. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure we actually know that much detail about why lung pulmonary decline happens because of diabetes. We just, I don't think we actually know specifically. It's very well described about like the eye disease and the kidney disease. It's all been like very well studied and mapped out. We're still learning about, and I think CF lung disease is unique in many ways too, then because not all people with diabetes will develop lung disease. Um, and so, I, I, you know, like there's lots of people with type one diabetes and, you know, again, they, they die from cardiovascular outcomes, not lung disease. And so I think um, there is definitely something unique about CF that we just don't know yet. Um, and I'm also finding that the answers aren't necessarily straightforward. <laughs> when you think you know it, then we learn something else. And it, it changes exactly what we thought we knew. So, so um, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Christine? Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Um, you know, I think how you described it regarding the eye disease 
is absolutely accurate. Um, and I don't think we fully know. Um, I think there's been thought that the increased, again, that increased BMI is so tightly tied to pulmonary function that there may be something there. Um, and that increased, um, whether it's muscle mass, um, stronger intercostal muscles, um, something, you know, something about having that weight on that seems to help the pulmonary function. I think there's something there. And, and the connection between those high blood sugars and lung function, I think it's an exciting area of research and folks are investigating it. Um, but I don't think we fully know to that, to the detail that you described that that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love the hypo that's hypothesis generated yeah. right there. I there love we go. It. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, so, and then obviously from an exercise perspective, um, it definitely caught my eye to see in your chart that CFRD was not necessarily uh, affected by diet and exercise as much as insulin treatment, um, which I think makes sense. Um, but then in your later slide that exercise and lifestyle style can have an impact. And I've noticed with my CFRD, um, not only short-term, but long-term that when I'm exercising consistently and chronically, that I'm definitely requiring less insulin. And if I don't adjust downward, that I am having more of the, the low blood sugars and the, the hypoglycemia, um, especially at nighttime. Um, so it's, again, tricky. And then uh, with uh, Trikafta and, and now having this new issue of obesity in CF um, and thinking about the the need for, I guess it's more type two that would need weight loss. Um, is there like a tip, rhetorically asking, is there like a tipping point in, in BMI where BMI is too high? I'll, I'll start off by addressing the exercise comment and then I'll let Melissa <laughs> chime in as well. Um, to your point, I noticed that as I was looking at going through the slides that exercise was not listed. Now, historically, exercise has not been recommended as the you know, sole treatment Primary. for yeah. CF-related diabetes as it, it may be as first recommended as first-line treatment for type 2. It doesn't mean that exercise won't help or affect CF diabetes. And as you've noticed yourself personally, it certainly can. Um, exercise is, is great for CF. Um, there's a lot of literature looking at that. Um, interestingly, I did a quick literature search before this to see what the literature showed looking at CF diabetes and exercise. And there's not much there. Um, there are some studies suggesting that exercise capacity may be reduced with um, progressive glucose intolerance, um, but there have not been any that I have seen any interventional studies looking at the impact of diet of diet of exercise on CF related diabetes. But as you mentioned, um, in this in a similar way that exercise can impact blood sugars in people with type two, exercise um, can improve insulin resistance. And so it can actually um, decrease blood sugars and can and can really affect, depending on the activity and the individual, can really affect blood sugars. Um, so you're absolutely correct there. Well, and and probably add to muscle mass, which yes, I didn't realize absolutely, absolutely. having more muscle mass uh, facilitates the uptake as well. Right. Um, and then just Briefly, I, I think there, we will have to see a, what the future holds, but um, I think your question was right on the mark there. Is there a, a tipping point in BMI? Because historically it was always just push those calories, push those calories, get that BMI up. But people are starting to look at that. And I think as, as folks are, are getting healthier, it's gonna be a really important question. Um, is this gonna look more like type two or have more features of type two diabetes? So, right. Yeah. Great. And Giorgio, I see you had a question in the chat of with Trikafta. Is there any type of projection of how much weight one might gain? Uh, I have found that 
there's been a, an unfortunate kind of coincidence of like pandemic weight gain with trikafta weight gain and they kind of <laughs> together. Um, <laughs> it was just an unfortunate year. Um, but um, but it, I, I, for my patients, I found it's very individualized. Most people do gain some weight. Some people gain a lot of weight and then other people just a few pounds. And I, I personally haven't been able to figure out why that, why that is. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I would agree with that. The same. It's pretty variable. Most seem to gain some weight, but not all. Um, some don't just don't seem to gain as much weight. And I think why that is, is probably it's an ongoing area of research. Mm. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I was I, curious. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I wanted to, to add, I completely agree with Christine about the exercise and, and the weight gain. Um, I think it's so interesting. And this will, I also be, I think, an important area for research is like we've always focused on quantity of calories. Like you need to eat 3,000 calories, you need this number, I don't care how you get it, whether it's McDonald's or candy or soda, just get your calories in. And I think now it's clear that the quality of those calories is going to be, and reevaluating the number of calories is going to actually be really important moving forward. Mm. So. Sorry, but what, what were you, did you have another question? Um, yes, but sorry, on that calorie el element, um, you know, e like more synthetic calories, like the high fructose corn syrup that was just so difficult for the body to break down. My father years ago was a researchaholic and, and always felt like that would be the root cause of obesity in our society. But you know, when I eat something that, or drink a soda that has it in it, like I can, even with my normal doses of insulin, like my sugar levels will outrun the insulin peak. But um, I, so that wasn't my question, but uh, the, um, so the progression of CFRD, um, are like w once you're diagnosed and you're you have a management schedule um and for that might be both bolusing and long acting um is it expected that cfrd progresses over time even when being managed and if so especially in terms of insulin resistance can it potentially become untreatable? Oh, I stumped them. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, it's, it's such a great question. Um, I do want to reassure you that I, I have yet to ever meet a patient where CFRD is untreatable because we have insulin and they work. They're not perfect, but they work. And it may be that we need to find a different insulin. We need to to different technology devices to help you. But um, even in the worst case scenario, you don't make any insulin at all and you're really insulin resistant, we can still treat you. Um, and so that's the good news. Um, the, what often happens with, um, with CFRD is it, it, and as Christine so really eloquently explained, it's, it is um, this grad, this destruction of beta cells over time. And so in the beginning, a lot of times, you know, some people don't even need long acting insulin when they're first, used. they just need a short acting insulin to cover their meals. But when they're not eating, their pancreas is able to make enough insulin. Um, a lot of, not, not always, and, and the timeline is different for everybody um, and, and how this happens. But a lot of the times, um, then it kind of gets, you know, gradually less insulin, so then you need you need to add that long acting insulin because your fasting blood sugars are going high. And then you might need more insulin over time. Um, but uh, that, how that happens, I find is very individualized and it, it can fluctuate. So when people are sick, they need a lot more. When they get better, they need a lot less. Um, and so I think it's, it, it's very variable um, and, and difficult to predict, which is one of the reasons why it can be really challenging to manage. Um, for many, many people. 
Yeah, that really blew my mind the first time I really got sick when like, and realizing like, it's not doing anything and you keep like stacking and stacking and eventually it crashes and it's like, Bee, Bee, Bee. <laughs> but it's, it's mind blowing, like how drastic of a difference it can make mm -hmm. of your responsiveness to insulin. Yeah. Um, and the other piece that really kind of raised my eyebrow that um, Christine, you mentioned in your slides was the presence of glucose in the nasal and lung secretions and um, the correlating rates. So I'm, my side hobby is a pH-aholic. <laughs> so I'm always thinking about alkaline and acidity and um, does, is glucose associated with acidity? Stump them again. Whoa. I'm like, there are data time. on the pH of, of, of um, I think these airway secretions. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head if that's not my specific area. We know yeah. that, we do know that DKA, so diabetic ketoacidosis, mm -hmm. certainly, mm -hmm. um, when the body doesn't have enough insulin it's associated with this acidotic state. But the glucose itself, I would have to get back to you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason I ask is, um, you know, I've, with my own CF, have just found a lot of curiosity in the involvement of, you know, bicarbonate insufficiency, um, variability of Body, bodily fluids, not so much the blood, unless you're in ketoacidosis, um, but also the preferable environments of some of those multi-resistant bacteria. And the research that I find that hasn't really been specifically on people with CF, but has been through porcine lungs with CF and um, their, their pHs of lung secretions. Um, and it, it didn't say anything about glucose in that article, but um, how those bacteria, from what I've found, uh, tend to have a, a preference for slightly acidic environments. And it, it seems as though, um, in my mind anyway, that the, the bicarbonate issues of the pancreas um, combined with high blood sugars um, and whatever interrelation they have. Um, I, I always wonder if that is an element of having a hospitable environment in our lungs for those bacteria. That is another great hypothesis generating. I know, I know. Um, I mean, one of the other centers <laughs> just informed me about um, the CF Foundation has, um, what was it? I don't know, I don't know, Tiffany, if you were on that call, but they have like a, a portal where you can submit like your ideas and questions around research that there isn't much known about. You know, I think that's community voice um, that yeah, the CF it. Yeah, it's it's actually fantastic. I've worked with them on um, different projects and it's a great way to have your voice heard and to get involved. Absolutely, community voice, yeah. yeah. So that's on my list of uh, high priorities. You need to, you need to, all of these, submit those. Yes. Right, absolutely. right. Great. <laughs> Great. Well, you guys are amazing. And I'm so thankful for your expertise on this because it really, this deep dive into CFRD is so necessary. And like I said, when, when we first spoke that, you know, I'm, I'm, I know a lot of people that are, you know, the, the CF population are essentially experts in their own body. And a large part of that is knowing the how things work, how the medications work, how our bodies work, um, what's needed, what's normal, what doesn't feel normal. Um, and so this explanation is really helpful and I hope uh, very valuable to the community. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. And um, we will be sending you some Strollo t-shirt uh, sweatshirts as well. Now that the warm weather is here. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> After I get back to Boston, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all again, and have a wonderful rest of your day. And have a good um, evening. For those of you watching, please check back. Um, again, our website is uh, cflf.org slash strollo I'm going to put that up quickly. And uh, again, thank you to our sponsors that have helped made this program possible. So thank you again, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.